going to talk about so the Community Resilience Forum and also the Climate Safe Rooms. Um, they're both on Wadawurrung country, so it's where both Karina and I are, are sort of streaming in to this call. Um, and it's it's quite um, really exciting for us because we're working on our very first uh, wrap um, for the organisation Geelong, Geelong Sustainability this year. So I'm um, hoping to really make fantastic progress on reconciliation and integrate it into everything that we're we're doing so it actually becomes so embedded in what we're doing. Um, so let's see if I can share screen now. All right. Um, hopefully, has that come up okay? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Um, I, I won't do too much about us, but um, just as, as Vicky said, we're a not-for-profit. Um, we have grown a lot in the last couple of years. So we've got, we've been running since 2007 and it was a a real grassroots initiative to want to act on climate change. In fact, the very first event we did was um, a rally down at Eastern Beach in Geelong, if if anyone knows Eastern Beach there. Uh, since that time, we've, we've grown and progressed a lot. Um, we now have six staff um, working across a whole range of different projects, um, uh, sustainability uh, related, but we're really trying to create positive solutions as much as possible. Um, We've got about 250 financial members and a um, kind of reach that's around about getting close to 20,000 people across our email network and our social media now. So uh, it, it has grown. Um, we try and structure our work across these, across these four pillars, but in the last year, we've really pulled focus quite a lot um, on climate action um, in particular and wanting to support our community to create pathways and um, ways that makes it easy for them to reduce emissions down. So a lot of the projects that we are working on are about um, helping households um, with direct emission reduction. So it might be education sessions, but then also offering um, a way to participate in a bulk buy, for example. Um, and um, yeah, that's been really important to us to, to sort of make sure the work is not just about talk, but resulting in real action. Um, and the other area where we're working on quite strongly at the moment is um, support for vulnerable households, as you'll hear with the Climate Safe Rooms project that we're doing. That's our kind of uh, flagship, flagship project in that um, space. But we also advocate and lobby um, our local MPs for climate action and um, getting uh, some good relationships, but we're wanting to really make it very clear of what we want and why, particularly in the lead up to the um, coming elections. So um, with that, I might throw over to Karina now from our team, just to, um, Karina organised this resilience forum. So can I pass over to you to, to do a little recap on that one? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm the program coordinator at Geelong Sustainability, and I run our monthly or bi-monthly events for the community. And essentially, they hit various topics that we think are important to be able to support our community in these times. And we partner with various other organisations to strengthen this um these conversations with the community and so um we came about um as as you guys have spoken about the importance of speaking around re um, resilience with our community and how do we build that and so we decided to run a community climate resilience forum and we ran that in partnership with common ground project which is an amazing local organization um, that is really focused around food systems and food security and regenerative farming and agriculture and how um, that plays into the part of resilience as well. So we did this as part of the National Sustainability Living Festival, which was really great to have a Geelong, um, Geelong featured in that festival, in that larger festival. But we offered this out to our community just to start the conversation of what are some of the things that we need to consider as a community, because we do great work in as Geelong Sustainability, but where um, there's limitations to what we do, we really need the whole community to be um, partaking in this transition and partaking in these conversations about how to build resilience locally. And so we decided that um, having a panel of a diversity of speakers in the um, touching on 
various areas of resilience would be a really interesting way to um, just introduce that topic to a lot of our community members. So we had um, a great array of speakers. We had Amy from Common Ground Project who spoke about um, the food systems and food security around climate disasters and also just climate the climate emergency that we're facing. So how do we build that resilience locally, and that localization, um, the important um, things that we need to consider moving forward now that we are actually experiencing the impacts of climate change um, already. And then we had uh, Lauren Watts, who was from Surf Go Shire, so uh, and worked in the climate and sustainability department, and she brought the the council's focus the the more um strategy larger picture focus um and that was really great for people to be able to hear what were some of the systems that the council could put in place around um, the responsiveness of climate disasters but also for this resilience piece and then we had um amy uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Wayne from CFA around fire readiness. What conversations do we need to have? Um, because of course we live in a very fire prone area down here. Um, and so what do we need to be planning for our community, for ourselves? Um, and also how, what are some of the considerations that we need to have, um, when it comes to post and, um, pre-disaster so like the the lead up to these really fire danger heavy times and then if something does happen what are our situations and responses to that um and then we had Libby um, from Psychology for Safe Climate, which we just spoke about, which is great. Um, and she was really great to have there because it's so important, as we spoke about just um, earlier, around having that resilience emotionally. So in this times of a climate emergency, um, let alone climate disasters, when they happen, it's, there's this ongoing stress of this, you know, eco grief, eco stress, um, and that type of thing. And how, what do we need to do personally and as a community to support one another, um, mental health wise and resilience wise, in our emotional capacity to hold the complexity of these times? So we had these. Uh, amazing panelists um, and we shared uh, a variety of um, different topics and, and approaches and strategies for people to be able to put in place. Uh, it was, it happened to be that it ended up on one of the really really brutally hot days um and so Wayne from the CFA didn't actually end up being able to attend because he was attending um a fire and responding to a fire so that was a really interesting conversation piece um on the night because it was really like we were living the impacts as we as we were having these, th this event and that um, Lauren was actually had experience also in fire the fire piece so was actually being was able to bring that to the table anyway so we didn't miss that piece but it was also important for people to see that Wayne wasn't there and this is why and and to further deepen into those conversations so there was a lot of time for the community to ask questions um, to really just introduce these um, pieces and and think about what what do we need to consider um, as individuals, as families, as community members um, at these times and how do we, what role does individuals play, what roles do organisations play and what gaps do we maybe have? And so it was just a start of this conversation. Um, Common Ground Project is also doing an array of different um, climate resilient resilience education sessions following on from this so that was a nice flow on for anyone who wanted to deepen into certain topics um but it was a really great event we had about 70 people um attend from throughout the region and we were really looking forward to kind of seeing where we can best support the community going forward as well but yeah it was that was a bit of an overview of of the event that we ran Awesome, Karina. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I, I'm going to jump into talking about climate safe rooms now, but we'll happy to take questions when we get to the end because I'm sure there'll be questions about the Resilience Forum too. Um, so climate safe rooms uh, for us has been a, a project that's many, many years in the making, about six years all up. 
And the whole concept of it was about trying to build resilience to extreme weather, but particularly for vulnerable members of our community. So um, people that had quite poor health that was um, affected during either heatwave days or um, extreme cold. And so they were really, um, you know, the, the people that are going to um, suffer first to suffer the most um, as we see more and more um, increase in extreme weather from a direct result of climate. Um, basically, what we did through this is it was a, a pilot project which has now been completed. Um, and now we're looking at how to scale up from that pilot because it was really successful. But essentially, what is it in a nutshell? Um, it's trying to create a room in the home that is a comfortable space no matter what's going on um, out, outdoors. So if we've got those heat waves like the other week, um, still having one room that you can re retreat into, so to speak, um, and maintain your, your comfort to maintain your health at those times. Um, it was normally a, a, a sort of living room or um, open kitchen and dining room is the way that it worked out for most homes. Every home's a bit different with the layout. Um, but what we were able to do was um, upgrade the energy efficiency of, of just one room rather than the whole house and make it a, a bit more of a cost-effective thing to do. Um, and we did that by doing things like insulation upgrades, um, draft-proofing doors and windows. Um, we made sure each um, room had an efficient split system air conditioner. And then we coupled that with a, a solar system so that the um, the running costs around uh, actually maintaining a, a comfortable temperature indoors were, were not a problem for people because they knew that the, the solar system was generating that energy. So um, how all this concept sort of came about for us was there was a Lancet report. Um, so it's a really well-known medical journal um, and they'd done a report looking at uh, morbidity um, linked to extreme weather. And what struck us was that um, Australia was actually had far, far worse statistics than some of the European countries where it actually gets down to sub sub zero temperatures. And, um, and it's because our homes, our housing stock, um, particularly here in Victoria, it's built at a pretty, pretty low quality. So the average star rating of a home is, is less than two stars out of 10. And the other real uh, shock to us was that um, although we often associate um, deaths through heat waves and, you know, that, that heat wave really putting a huge toll on the system, um, and that is still a huge problem and will, will continue to be a huge problem as we see more and more heat waves. Um, and to give you a sense in our area, um, uh, you know, sort of Geelong region, about 250,000 people or so, um, in any given kind of heat wave event, you might uh, be able to link about a half a dozen deaths to that event. So it's, you know, this is real people's lives that you're talking about. But the, the flip side of that was it's actually the extreme cold. More people die from the prolonged cold than they do from the heat right now. And, um, that's just largely very easily to avoid by being able to maintain a, a house at a comfortable temperature. So that that kind of background piece led us to putting together a trial program. We we chatted to a bunch of different organisations and the more people we talked to, the more um, interest and enthusiasm there was to do the project. And so we, we tr went for a trial. We applied for some grant funding through the state government and secured $300,000 to, to run a pilot. Uh, we were aiming to do up to 20 homes. The um, the trial ended up having 16 homes that were part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we uh, used it as a research trial. So it was very much very heavy data monitoring um, uh, of the participants' surveys before and after and um, producing a pretty solid report, which guides um, future work for us. Um, so here's a quick snapshot on just who was involved in this. Um, obviously the government I mentioned funded it before. We partnered with the city of Greater Geelong. They have um, or uh, had a very good um, community care department, which uh, uh, worked in with um, 
vulnerable households and supporting um, people around um, you know, in, uh, sort of aging in place. Uh, and they were able to connect us to a number of um, the participants so that they effectively were recruiting uh, participants for the, for the trial. Uh, we worked with CSIRO around monitoring equipment and I'll talk um, about that a little bit later, but they had a very sophisticated system that um, was able to monitor uh, people's activities of daily living in the home, as well as some other temperature and energy related things. And then um, we worked with EcoMaster who uh, were really experts in energy efficiency upgrades and brought a huge amount of information and um, in-kind support to help us through, through that, this being our first sort of research-based audit program that we've done. And then Uniting was the other key partner who um, helped with delivering some behaviour change um, and education sessions to participants. So they have expert um, energy workers that can go out and actually sit and talk to folks about how to actually get the most out of your solar system, for example, or how do you how to operate your your air conditioner so that it's the most efficient? It's going to keep comfortable, but also not end up with really high bills. Um, I, I won't go into these. There's way too much text on on this slide, <laughs> but uh, essentially it was designed to to prove a model. It was really the outcomes for us. We wanted to create that linkage between um, improving the thermal envelope and the energy efficient efficiency of the home and link that back to health and overall comfort um, and which we, we've been able to do, which is fantastic. Um, I think I talked about this one a little bit earlier, but the, the upgrade types um, that you can see there in those dot points at the bottom, they were all delivered at no cost to the participants. So that was a really important part because um, most of the households that were part of this were in that vulnerable um, cohort, they absolutely did not have the, the funds available to be able to do this work themselves. So it wouldn't have happened if we had have asked them to pay themselves. And so the, the grant funding was able to cover all of the coordination work relating to all of the trades that were needed, um, doing an energy audit, coming up with a plan for what, what was needed, and then paying for each of the upgrades. Uh, we ended up... Um, uh, paying, oh, actually, I'll, I'll skip that one. I'll come back to that one. Um, just talking about upgrades. So we spent a, a little under $8,000 um, in terms of work on, on each home. And a large part of that was the solar system. And it was quite a modestly sized solar system. They were not large. Most of them were around uh, two or three kilowatt size solar systems. So it was pretty well matched nicely to covering the air conditioner um, usage. And then you can see also the air conditioner and the draft proofing work and insulation work were the other major costs there. Um, there were some other miscellaneous things like upgrading light fittings um, from halogen to LED, for example. Um, and sometimes a handyman needed to refit a door or um, uh, patch something up um, as a result of the upgrades. But um, yeah, with that yeah, relatively small amount of money, being able to create a, a, a safer room, if you like, um, was was really, really great, I think. And um, we've been able to prove that the results of doing that will by far pay back for themselves, not only in energy costs, but also in health-related um, or, or toll on the health um, care system, if you like. Um, the way we went about it, we audited each of the homes using some pretty um, uh, sort of technical tools. They're tools that energy assessors would use. Um, the the NATHERS, which is a, a whole of house energy rating scheme was really, really useful to us. And it helped us um, develop a plan of which retrofits we would uh, do to the home. So we, we often couldn't do everything we would have liked to because we had a limited budget, but um, this helped us really visualize uh, the the difference it would make. So uh, looking at that graphic, and sorry, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I love graphs, but um, you can see there that the uh, the just by adding underfloor insulation to this particular home made the, the biggest difference. Um, whereas you may often think, for example, well, 
why don't we just upgrade the ceiling insulation? That's the first thing we should do. Well, actually, in this case, um, the, the data-informed view of that really helped us um, guide the work. Um, so uh, the other element was the energy monitoring. Um, we had a range of different smart sensors, uh, which is part of a, a CSIRO system called Smarter Safer Homes. Uh, they were wanting to do some research around linking um, uh, health back to climate. So it was just a really great partnership. And it monitored things like movement. So there was um, a, about a half a dozen of these small um, little motion sensors throughout the home. Uh, it, they measured humidity and temperature. And then there was a range of different power sensors. And even um, these accelerometers were installed on some doors uh, one on the fridge, so you could tell when the fridge was being opened and closed, one on the front door, um, so you could tell when people were in and out. And that, you, you, know, you might ask why, that actually builds a really interesting profile around um, what people's behaviour is like on a normal temperature day versus a day when it's actually extreme weather. So um, it might be extreme cold you might just go to bed for the whole day, for example. So it's built build up a bit of data set around that, um, which I might say we are still waiting for the CSIRO's um, full analysis of that um, activities of daily living. Um, I won't play this video, but I'm happy to share these slides and the link around later. Um, so we featured on ABC News about the program and really helped get the word out a bit more broadly um, just about the work. Um, this is an overview of the timeline. Um, Vicky, I'm just mindful of time. Are, am I right for another five or so, or what's your... Yeah, you're still yeah. good, Dan. Okay. I think you're going um, until 105... Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, da -da -da. Yeah, no, you're still good. Keep oh, going. I've got plenty of time. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, so being the first time we've done this kind of program, it, it took us quite a while to plan um, and to recruit households. Interestingly, people felt like it was too good to be true because we were essentially offering, you know, up to $10,000 worth of free upgrades. And uh, it's a bit of a sad reflection of our society, I think, that people just immediately put this, the scam radar up. Um, so recruiting participants had to come through a trusted source. Uh, we, we found that was really key. Um, unfortunately, we were delayed during the audits and retrofitting with COVID-19 hitting and lockdowns around that. So that put almost a year, um, well, it, it pushed it back um, significantly, but um, in, in the end, uh, it, it at least delayed us by a year, um, probably a year and a half. Um, and then we've had a really solid data monitoring period, so 18 months um, after the retrofits. And um, the report uh, was released uh, last year in the middle of the year. And just to touch on some of the results, so uh, we we expected that we would be able to, able to produce quite good energy reductions, energy usage and um, energy efficient, efficiency improvements. and Certainly solar is a pretty well well proven thing. So that was no surprise to us, but uh, we definitely showed that we could reduce energy costs. Um, we showed that the solar system could cover the costs of uh, running the, the heating and cooling. And most of the participants uh, ended up having very close to a $0 bill through through summer when the solar system's generating the most. So that, that was fantastic. Um, that also, I, I believe, um, in looking at the survey results, created a huge sense of well-being. Just knowing that the energy costs were a lot lower. So um, we had comments from some participants where they would say, uh, essentially, I can go out and get a coffee now. You know, it's things that you or I perhaps just take a bit of. Um, uh, you know, we don't even think about doing it, but it made the world of difference. Just being able to do that and feel like a normal person again. Um, we improved the the comfort. Um, we've got a couple of slides around that, and and also the health and health um, side of things too. So, um, to give you a bit of a sense, so this is just based on some of the survey data. So we did really achieve significant thermal comfort improvements, 
and um, uh, often those improvements were even reported on days when uh, the participants were not running their heating and cooling. So the, the room is just more comfortable, even if you're not pumping that air conditioner, which is really encouraging. Um, most of the participants uh, were really, really happy to be involved, so strongly agreed that they um, had had some great energy bill reductions, um, that, that they were far more comfortable, that they'd recommend the program to others. And there was some great self-reported insights there just about reductions in, um, in the doctor's visits, but also improved mobility, improved mental health, all of this while we went through COVID. So, in, and if you think, if you've seen the stats on mental health through COVID, they took a huge dive. So I think that's real testament to, to the outcomes of the program. Um, temperature wise, we made some pretty significant inroads. So um, being able to reduce exposures to um, below 18 degrees and that's 18 degrees is the, the sort of uh, nationwide standard of a, of a comfortable and safe temperature. So we reduced that exposure by two hours per day um, in 2021, an hour per day in 2022, and um, the same on the extreme um, temperature sides. So uh, it does become very hard to compare year on year with some of these things because of the fluctuation of weather, but um, six and a half hours less exposure to uh, temperatures exceeding 30 degrees. So we were really pleased with that outcome. Um, and then the cost savings from avoided healthcare, which I sort of alluded to uh, earlier, but um, what there are some similar studies as well that were conducted by Sustainability Victoria. And um, in their study, they found $887 per person was um, saved in avoided uh, healthcare costs just in one one winter period. So uh, there is a huge case for doing this and for government to fund these kind of initiatives due to the um, reduced toll that will take later on on the healthcare system. Um, and just briefly, uh, I'll just sort of wrap up, I think, on what we learned. So uh, in taking on something like this, it was... Uh, quite a lot of moving parts and if if you haven't coordinated an audit program where you've got multiple trades and um, multiple uh, stakeholders that you have to communicate to uh, including the participants who needed um, to be kept up to date about progress and so on and often with the type of participants you couldn't just flick a text message to you had to you know, have a call and have a phone call for 10 or 15 minutes um, Project management and coordination was the key, the key part, and a big realization to us that that is an essential piece that needs to come with any retrofitting programs. And there's not one size that fits all, so every home was quite different. Uh, we also learnt that you do need to quality check tradespeople, um, and uh, that includes doing random random checks of the work. Um, don't believe that they've uh, necessarily done what they said they they have done. Um, so you do need to check that. And the other um, insight for us is if we're looking at scaling this, which we are, we, we want to do um, 100 homes next, and then we have an ambition to do 1,000 homes across our region, uh, we do need to leverage efficiencies of scale, particularly with suppliers. So we're having a bit of a bigger volume of installations can certainly help that and um uh, you know, ask for better pricing from your suppliers. So we we believe in this trial, we probably paid a fairly premium price, particularly around um, after COVID time as well. So uh, and the last part, which was a really key insight in these kind of programs, don't forget behaviour change. Uh, and what I mean by that is even still by providing an air conditioner and a solar system, we have participants through this program that are still making choices to not turn the air conditioner on, even when their health could be impacted by, by not doing that. And so there is this mindset of being quite frugal and trying to save money and I'll be right. And uh, so we feel like that uh, more education around the, the particularly that you can do this and it's going to be powered by the solar system 
Um, so, you, you know, be comfortable in these hot days, be comfortable in these cold days. Don't just sort of sweat it out because you'll end up in hospital again, for example. So that was a key um, thing. And we, we, we did some behavior change, but certainly we would have liked to do a whole lot more. So I think I'll leave it there. I could talk about this project for a long time, but I'm sure there's questions as well. So I'll stop screen share and happy to open up. Uh, we'll throw back to you, Vicky, if you if you want to facilitate questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Dan. It's both of those are like such great examples of what um, groups can be doing in their community. Um, and yeah, that's one reason why we wanted to get you to share it is because part of this alliance is. Um, for people to learn about things that they can take back to their communities and possibly replicate and um, do it there as well. So both of those, I think, are two things that would be brilliant if they could be replicated all across Victoria and every community.